Hey guys, I'm Chad Hoover with Kayak Bass Fishing and welcome to Fish USA's Phases of Fishing. All right, so for this video, we're gonna talk about finding bass in the spring. And this is an expansion of an earlier video that you can find the link in my description box where I talk a little bit more about finding bass in the spring. I'm gonna tell you about how I do it, right? Because it's easiest to teach what you do instead of trying to teach what you think someone else should do, right? So it's easy. We're gonna trade on my experience and I'm gonna share that with you. So let me get you started with just a basic overview. I've talked about it in my last video that when it comes to finding bass, late winter transition into spring, I really start shallow and start to work my way deep. And let me tell you why I do that. The water column warms up on top first. That warm water is lighter than cold water. I explained that in the other video, so I'm not gonna get too deep into it. But fish tend to seek out that warmer water. The bait fish start to seek out that warmer water. And I've got a strategy for finding big bass early without spooking them and to allow myself to be a lot more strategic. And it's real simple. I actually spook scout or reaction bite scout. Now what that means is I'm paddling through shallow water, sometimes without a rod in my hand, and I do it only off peak. What I mean by that is if I'm paddling through lily pads, I'm gonna make sure it is off peak from the feeding time. I'm gonna go in there when the bass shouldn't be biting. That, that kills two birds with one stone for me. For one, it gives me something to do off peak and I can scout and I can eliminate water. Uh, especially doing this during a tournament preparation uh, strategy. But two, it allows me to, if I do spook that fish, to set the table to mark that spot and come back later to catch it. So let me tell you how I do it. I'll tie on something like a Zoom Horny Toad, uh, a fluke that's weedless with a light, light, light bullet weight, maybe a sixteenth of an ounce, maybe an eighth of an ounce in front of it. Or I'll throw a Cinco on. And if I'm tournament fishing, that Cinco will be on a screw lock where there's no hook in it. If I'm not tournament fishing, I'll have a Cinco tied on. I'll have one tied on wacky, so I can create a little bit more of a disturbance, and I'll have another one tied on uh, that is just weightless. So I'm gonna paddle through the shallow water near the drop-offs, near the deep flat, looking for those first fish that are moving up. Here's where spook scouting comes into place. I'll have my depth finder on. I'll be paddling through shallow water. And if I get that and the pad's breaking, and I know it's not a carp, which you're just gonna have to figure out how carp and bass uh, and maybe even big gar and things like that look different uh, in the water. For the most part, for me, carp will keep running for a long ways and they'll knock pads up. Bass will generally sprint to safety and then stage up again. So if it's if you see the, the, the pads being knocked away for 150 yards, that's probably not a bass. Uh, that's probably a big carp. So what I'm about to tell you doesn't apply. What I like to do is have my depth finder on and then sometimes I'll just use my cell phone and I'll mark a waypoint. Now I'm doing this off peak because that fish really wasn't that aggressive and I probably wasn't gonna get a bite. Then four to six hours or maybe two or three days later, I'm gonna come back to that spot. If you're a deer hunter and a lot of times you go scout, you don't go scouting and then climb the tree the same day. And so when you hunt for big bass, you should think the same way. You should go spend your time scouting an area, mark a spot where you know a big bass calls home, put a waypoint on your GPS and then back out and then either come back later that day when the feeding time is more appropriate or leave it alone and come back in a couple of days when the conditions are better. Maybe the wind is blowing across the lake and the, 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 the conditions are not conducive to catching that fish. Maybe the wind is favorable, so you come back later that day. Again, we'll talk about all of that when we get a little bit more in depth. Today, I wanna to talk about two things, two, two things. I wanna talk about spook scouting and I wanna talk about getting a topwater reaction bite. All topwater fishing is not created equal. A lot of times we hear topwater and everything topwater is thrown into that category, whether it is something like a little fat whopper plopper or whether it is a small buzz bait, something like that, or whether it is a swim jig. Wait, a swim jig, topwater? Yeah, let's talk about that. And then, or even something like a multi-rig lure, like I have here from Red Alert Lures with a, uh, a Yamamoto Zeko swim, swim bait on it. So topwater fishing. All topwater fishing is not created equal. So one of my most effective techniques for finding big bass, for catching big bass, 
and for marking big bass that I'll come back to later, is to throw a lightweight lure like a Cinco, hold my rod tip up and slow reel it, which is just creating a little V and look for either a spook fish that takes off or just a little waffle, a little ripple in the water. Maybe the pad just moves a little bit. Maybe I see a, maybe I see a, a, an eddy where that bass kicked its tail and swam away and it created that eddy on the surface. And I might not necessarily get a bite and I'm expecting not to get a bite because we're off peak. But let's say I see that swirl and that bass pulls up and that pad stalk moves. I stop that lure on top of it and I jiggle it for a second. And then I shake it off and let it fall in the water. Then that fish eats it. In a lot of cases, that's actually a reaction bite when people don't think about that as a reaction bite. So if you're swimming that thing along the top and you bump it into a pad stalk and that bass happens to be laying up against the top of that pad with its back against it, taking in that heat from the sun and that lure hits that pad right in its face and it hits it, a lot of times that's a reaction bite. So you're gonna get reaction bites on top with a subtle topwater presentation. By and large, if you're using a more aggressive topwater presentation, it doesn't sneak up on that fish. So you're not gonna get a reaction bite. You're only gonna get those aggressive fish that are actually targeting that topwater lure because they want to attack and eat it, not because it's a reaction bite. There's a difference between a bite to eat something and a bite to kill something or a reaction bite where the fish almost bit it out of self-defense. So again, I'll paddle along real slow and when I spook fish, I mark them on my depth finder. When I get home, I take all of my waypoints in all the places that I marked a big fish and I lay that over a map and I say to myself, ah, here's a pattern. Or I say to myself, no pattern emerged, so I'll go back and scout again. By and large, I can generally find a consistent theme between the waypoints of where I spook these big bass that kills two birds with one stone for me. For one, it lets me know where big fish already are and I can leave them alone. It allows me to take that piece and then apply it to other places around the lake to see if I can develop a secondary, a third, a fourth spot especially when it comes to tournament fishing, or if you've got different winds and you wanna fish a different wind uh, on a different day, it's a lot like having different hunting spots with different and stand locations with different winds. Same concept, you're hunting big fish, you should start to take all these variables into a case. We're gonna do a video called Let's Get Windy, where we talk about the wind, all the things that the wind does to the fishery, some of the technology and apps out there that will help you better predict them and better uh, use them to your advantage or to your, you know, to avoid them being a detriment to you. But we'll talk about that in another version of uh, another video in the Phases of Fishing series. But today, I want to tell you two things, and then we're going to be done with this video. I want these to be these little two for tips where you can get some value out of watching these videos. They're easy to digest, and you can take them out on the water and apply them to catch more fish. I am a big fan of spook scouting early in the season, in the winter time. I wanna get those first big fish that start to move up. I wanna get them when they're really not trying to eat, but they're trying to lay up against that, that top water, uh, warming water um, column to get warm, and then they move into the feeding phase once the primary feeding time kicks in or the secondary feeding time. But when I'm looking for them first is I wanna find those fish where I can get away with spooking them and come back later and catch them. I'm gonna mark those waypoints. I want map study. To be, uh, to be augmented by time on the water. I wanna take those waypoints and go overlay the map or look at the map right there on my depth finder and go, oh, this is what's going on. And when you get advanced enough to start doing it on your depth finder or doing it on the Navionics app on your phone, then what you're doing is you're making adjustments while you're on the water. And if you're fishing a tournament or if you're fishing against some buddies or if you're just out there trying to maximize your time on the water to catch more fish, you can develop, you can see these patterns develop yourself Look at Navionics or your, your software or your chip maps in your depth finder and you can find other places like that and you could go try to further uh, validate the pattern or completely invalidate the pattern and look for other variables that will cue you into what the fish are doing. So I like to move that lure across the surface real slow, bumping it into pads, uh, ticking it into grass stalks and things like that, looking for that reaction bite, that thing that I hit that thing and it makes them bite but they didn't intend to. No hook if I'm fishing a tournament the next day and I don't want to sore mouth my fish. Hook if I'm trying to catch them and bring you guys video content and things along those lines, but, or if you're just out fishing for fun, which, you know, the vast majority of you guys are. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow you to be first. If you want to catch big fish, be first. By the time you're hearing about everybody else catching them, the vast majority of these fish are starting to get educated. They're coming off of the spawn phase. They're moving out and they're going to get... Uh, distributed throughout the fishery to the point where they're a lot more uh, unpredictable. And so if you can get out there and be first, 
which is the reason I came to Florida to do this series so that if you're a little further north, this hasn't happened yet. Down in Florida, it's in full force, and that's why I wanted to come down here and refresh my mind on what things I'm thinking about so that I can share that with you so that you can catch more fish. You're probably not wiping sweat off your face where you're at getting ready for spring fishing, but I am because I'm down in here in beautiful Lake County, Florida. So that's going to do it for today's tip. Get out there and develop patterns by spooking fish, marking the spot, taking all of those spots and see what characteristics they have in common. Reel that subtle lure on top, that Cinco, that fluke, that weightless worm, that trick worm, dropping it into the holes and waiting to see if something eats it. Jody Queen proved that concept, winning the first stop of the Claremont chain. You can do the same thing, but at the same time, you can use this as a practical application for improving your fish scouting so you can develop patterns better. And that's the purpose of this series. I'm Chad Hoover. This is the Phases of Fishing. Thanks to Fish USA, the folks at Lake County, Florida, for making the spring series possible. I'll see you guys in the next video. Smash that thumbs up if you like this type of comment. And if you're new to the channel and you want to see more, hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications so you'll know each and every time I release a new video.